Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted and thrilled to introduce Rob Shapiri for the MSR Colloquium. Uh, Rob is a, a researcher in uh, Microsoft New York City, formerly professor at Princeton University, and before that, a researcher at AT&T Labs. Um, he's uh, a preeminent name in the field of machine learning. He invented a technique called boosting that, if you know almost anything about machine learning, you have probably heard of it. And if you don't, you should run out immediately after this talk and try to find out about it, um, or, buy, or buy his book, <laughs> or just boost a copy from someone who has the book. Uh, uh, so he's been uh, you know, a hugely influential person in the field, uh, also influential in writing some of the uh, uh, seminal papers on regret analysis of multi-armed bandit problems. And today he's going to be telling us about the latest and very exciting chapter in that story. Welcome, Rob. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, it's loud. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about the contextual bandits problem. Uh, joint work with Alec Agarwal, Daniel Su, Satyan Kale, John Langford, and Li Hong Lee. Uh, so let me start with um, a couple of concrete examples of the kind of problem we're thinking about. So uh, this one is uh, very well known by now. Um, so you know, imagine that you're running a website, and um, the website, when a user shows up, needs to decide on which advertisements or which content to present to a user, like which news articles to present. Um, and the user, so what happens repeatedly is that the website is visited by some user, and the user typically arrives with some profile. In other words, we usually know something about the user, the person's profile, browsing history, and so on. And then based on that information, the website needs to decide on the advertisement to present, or the newspaper article, or other content to present to the user. And then the user responds, so maybe the user clicks on the ad or leaves the page or whatever. There's some response. And the goal here is for the website to make choices that will elicit some behavior in the user, like typically you want the user to click on the advertisement. Okay, here's another uh, example, which is medical treatment, um, you know, a toy version of medical treatment. Um, but so, what happens in this scenario is a doctor is visited by a patient, and then again, the patient arrives with some information. Uh, so the person has some symptoms, and there are some results of some tests, and you know how old the person is, and so on. And based on that information, the doctor decides on a treatment for the patient, and then the patient responds in some way. So the patient recovers, or gets worse, or never comes back, or, or whatever. And so the goal, again, is to make choices that will maximize some favorable outcome. So in other words, you want the patient to actually get better. So abstracting these problems uh, looks something like this. So what's happening is repeatedly there's some agent. So in one example, it's the doctor. In another, it's the website. Uh, I'm going to call that agent the learner because the goal here is to do some learning. So the learner is presented with some information, some context of some kind, like information about the patient. Then that learner has to decide on an action, like which treatment to prescribe. And then the learner observes some reward of some kind. So reward might be, um, you know, whether the patient gets better or not. And importantly, that reward, the old, the learner only gets to observe the reward for the action that was actually taken. Okay, so that makes it what's called a bandit problem. It's called bandit because it comes from the multi-arm bandit problem, which, so in other words, the name seems kind of weird, but it just comes uh, because of the history of the problem. 
Um, so the, the learner observes this reward, but only for the action that was taken. And the goal, again, is to learn to choose actions that will maximize the rewards. So I would claim that this is a very general and fundamental problem. I know that these are toy examples, but we're really trying to get at something fundamental here, which is how to learn to make intelligent decisions through experience. OK, so what are some of the issues in trying to attack this problem? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to say that this is what the contextual bandit's problem is. Bandit because of this aspect, and contextual since there's context involved. OK, so what are some of the issues in trying to attack this? Well, first of all, there's a classic dilemma uh, between exploitation and exploration. So on the one hand, the learner needs to exploit what has already been learned. So in a, um, you know, based on what you already know, you want to behave in the way that you think is best based on your current state of knowledge. But on the other hand, we need to be doing some kind of exploration so that we can learn about, uh, which other ways of behaving might give better results. So on the one hand, in medical diagnosis, you want to give the best drug available for a particular illness. But on the other hand, as a community, we need to be doing some exploration to be discovering new drugs as well. And how do you trade those off between exploitation and exploration? Uh, so that's true of any banded problem. But here we also have context. And so we need to be using that context effectively. And when you have context, you have many more ways of behaving than you do when you don't have context. Because you know, in principle, you could be uh, behaving according to any possible rule uh, that, that takes those contexts and maps them to actions. So there are many, many possible ways of behaving in this kind of setting. And of course, you never get to see the same context twice, or you're unlikely to see exactly the same person a second time. I mean, of course, you have the same patient coming repeatedly, but you know what I mean. OK, and another problem, a very important problem, is selection bias. So to do exploration, we need to be gathering statistics about what behaviors work well in what situations. Uh, so we need to be doing that exploration but at the same time, we're trying to exploit the knowledge that we already have. We're, all we're trying to behave in a way that will maximize rewards based on what we know. So we're gathering data, but we're not doing it in an unbiased way. We're collecting data that's going to be very highly skewed because, because of the fact that we're trying to exploit while we're also doing the data gathering. OK, so selection bias is a very serious problem. And of course, we care about efficiency. Our goal eventually is to come up with algorithms that will be efficient. And what do you mean by efficient? Connect that to campus or don't calculate Right. Uh, so everything. So it, we care about time efficiency, space efficiency, and also statistical efficiency, how quickly you learn. OK, so in this talk, I'm presenting a new and general algorithm for this problem. And uh, the, uh, in terms of efficiency, uh, what's important about this algorithm is that the, statistically, it's optimal or nearly optimal. In other words, the learning is happening as fast or almost as fast as is possible. Uh, in terms of how efficiently we're using the data that's being collected. And in addition, it doesn't matter what happens in here about time, but you learn with the minimum amount of data possible. That's the efficiency. Right, right. OK, that's the statistical. That's what I mean by statistical performance, OK, that we want statistically to be close to optimal. And then in terms of uh, time efficiency, uh, we're presenting an algorithm which is much, much faster than the previous algorithms and also much simpler. I mean, I know simplicity is a subjective thing, but in this case, I don't think anybody would dispute the fact that this algorithm is much simpler. Okay, okay so that was kind of an introduction. So what I want to do now is to come back to um, and look at things a little bit more formally. So this is really the same scenario that I had before. 
of what's happening. And let me just introduce a little bit of notation. So again, in the first step, the learner is observing a context, which I'll be calling xt. So t is the round number, the iteration number. Uh, and then based on that context, the learner chooses an action, at. Uh, so, um, so in this talk, we're assuming that there are k possible actions that we just call 1 through k. So we're thinking of k as not too huge. So maybe k is like 10 or maybe 100, but not a gigantic number. Uh, so the learner selects an action based on the context. And then the learner observes a reward for that action that was selected. Um, so let me just finish this. Algorithm to a case where like A is continuous but pretty smooth and its effect on the reward or something like that, so that effectively you could discretize it. Not at this point. Okay. okay. So this is this is what we can do at this point. But um, you, you're absolutely right that. You're talking to Alex Lipkin about like you know price discrimination type things where that's the natural way. To so there's a lot of open directions, and that that's a good one. Okay. So. Based on the action that, like I said, the learner receives and observes a reward, RT of AT. So the reward for the action that was actually selected. And in fact, there's one more step which is happening here, if you want to model this mathematically. In fact, what we're assuming is that at the same time that the context is selected, some some outside entity, call it the environment or nature, let's call it nature, nature chooses a reward for each of the k actions. Okay, so nature chooses but not, does not reveal a reward for each of the k actions. And so that's denoted here by this reward vector, where it's a vector where you have k entries, one for each of the k actions, and it specifies the reward, a number between 0 and 1, let's say, for concreteness. Um, for each of the k actions, okay? And then the learner chooses an action and gets the reward just for that action that was selected. Bobby? Is that context xt also being chosen by the same entity nature? Yeah, so let me, let me get to that in one second, okay. okay? Okay, so the goal now is to, uh, for now, this is somewhat of a lie. I'm going to change this in a second. But for now, we can think of the goal as that of maximizing the total reward. Okay, so this is the reward at time little t, and we're supposing there are capital T rounds altogether, so this is the total reward. And now to come back to Bobby's question, what we're assuming in this work is that these pairs, this pair of context and reward, are being chosen from some distribution. On every so there's some unknown distribution over these pairs, and on each round we're supposing that these are uh, chosen independently. Okay, so I'm not saying that xt and rt are independent of each other. On the contrary, we expect the context and the rewards to be very correlated because we want the context to be useful in choosing an action. I'm just saying that from one round to another, the choices of nature are independent. Okay. Yes? And does it matter if the rewards are equivalents? Does it, I mean, so are the, are, if the rewards are the same no matter, I mean, does that matter to this formulation? Well, uh, it doesn't, but it makes it kind of a boring, oh, are you saying from one round to another? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So if the rewards are exactly the same, independent of the context, then that's a special case uh, called the multi-armed bandit problem. I'll talk about that in a, in a second, but that's a much easier problem. But, yeah. yeah. And you assume that underlying distribution that generates the pass is kind of fixed, right? Not shifting. Over Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So easiest case that we're starting with. Okay, good. So here's just to make this a little bit more concrete. So maybe there are three actions, and so maybe the context, say a web user is a person, so this person shows up and you know that this person is a man and he's 50 years old and so on. And so nature chooses the context and then nature also chooses rewards or kind of potential rewards for each of the three actions, but does not reveal them to the user. Okay, so they're supposed to be hidden, the three rewards. Then the learner chooses an action, let's say action two, 
and receives that reward and also gets to observe it. And then this continues. So another person shows up, rewards are chosen, an action is selected, and a reward received, and so on. Okay, and, at, and the goal is to maximize this sum of rewards. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so special case is that was studied before this is the multi-armed bandit problem. That's the case where there's no context, which means that the rewards are chosen in exactly the same way on every round, independent of the context. So the co there is no context, or the context is irrelevant. And this is a much more studied problem. And in that case, what you're really trying to do is you're just trying to do as well as the best single action. So just this best one action. And so tacitly, what's being assumed there is that there's one action that gives high rewards, uh, which really doesn't make sense in the examples that I gave. That would be like there being a single treatment, which is perfect for all patients, regardless of their symptoms and the test results and you know anything else. It's ridiculous for medicine. And the same thing for the other example. Um, so in our setting, in the contextual bandit setting, we can use context to choose the actions. So how, how is that going to happen? Well, in that case, what we're supposing is that there might be a good decision rule, a good policy, we're calling it a policy, for choosing the actions based on the context. So just to be concrete, here's an example of what I mean by a policy. So it's a rule that says if the person is male in this example, then choose action two. Otherwise, if she's older than 45, choose action one. Otherwise, choose action three. OK, so it's, it's just a rule, a function that maps context to action. And by no means am I saying that the policies have to have a form like this. I'm just giving this as a concrete example. The point is that it's a decision rule. And in general, by a policy, which I'll denote by little pi, is just a mapping, a function that maps context to actions. <clears throat> so typically, the learner is working with some space of policies that I'm denoting by capital pi. That's supposed to be a capital pi. Uh, and we're thinking of that space as being very rich. OK, so maybe the policies that the learner is working with is the space of all decision trees. This is a decision tree, just a nested if-then-else rule of this kind. And so, um, well, first of all, we're going to assume that this policy space is finite, but it's typically going to be extremely large. So for instance, the policy space might be the space of all decision trees, which is an, a gigantic space, if you can imagine all possible if rules of this kind of form. So tacitly, what we're assuming now is that there exists a policy in this space that gives high rewards. So in other words, we're assuming that we know the form of the rule. That's what the policy space is really giving us. It's the form of the rule. So we know the form, but we don't know which particular rule, which particular policy is the good one, and that's what we want to learn. Uh, no, x does not need to be finite. So is policy that, space. Is actually infinite, right? Depends how you set it up. Uh, mm, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> OK, so for decision trees, it has to be uh, very, yeah. I, I actually think that this might be the easiest thing to generalize, this part about policy space being finite, to generalize it to infinite ones, but yeah. Uh, is your clarification about what you are less assumption. So what does it mean to have high rewards? For any, any uh, set of policies that you would have, there would be some policy that would give you the highest reward within that set, so. That's the one we want to compete with. Okay. That's exactly it. OK, so we're, we're going to try to do as well as the best policy in the space. OK, so if they're all lousy, then the learner will also 
not perform well, but if there's one which is good, then we want the learner to perform well also. Okay. Okay. So the goal now is to learn through experimentation to do what I just said, to do almost as well as the best policy in the space. And we're specifically allowing these policies to be very complex and expressive. Okay, and we hope that this will be a, a powerful approach that we can learn to do as well as really complicated rules. Um, so why is this a hard problem? Well, it's a hard problem because we're assuming that this space is extremely large, so exponential in any reasonable complexity measure. Okay, larger than we could, than we have computation time for. So how are we going to work with that huge space? And um, also, we, we, we need to be learning about all of the policies in this huge space simultaneously, while at the same time we're trying to perform as well as the best one. And when an action is selected, remember that we only get to observe rewards for policies that would have chosen the exact same action. Okay, so we're only actually getting feedback on a very small subset of the policies in this space. So, in other words, it's the same dilemma of exploration and exploitation, but now on a gigantic scale. Okay, so coming back to our formal model, all this part is the same, but let me clarify now what the goal is. So the goal now, to be more specific or more uh, precise, is that we want the learner to achieve high total or equivalently average reward in comparison to the best policy in the space. So in other words, we want small regret. So this is what I mean by regret. So this expression, don't even worry about the math if you don't want to, this expression is the average loss of the learner. And this is the average, not average loss, sorry, average reward of the learner. And this is the average reward of the best policy in the space. And so the difference is how well the learner is doing in comparison to the best policy in the space. And what we want is for that regret to go to zero, and we want it to go to zero as quickly as possible. Okay? Yeah? Is there any sort of idea from the background that if you have two contexts that are really close together, then the corresponding reward functions are very close together? Well, I guess we don't model that explicitly in any way. But yeah, you would, you would kind of expect that. Yeah. So somehow, I had the exact same thought, and I, I was wondering, I thought if, if, if you don't do that, it just seems like you're scaling the multi arm banner problem a lot of times. I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to work out how I'm going to get anything out of context if I don't put any restrictions on the relation between it, R's and X. the policy space, right? So you can consider smooth policies, for example, and those will have the properties that you and Josh are highlighting. If what you said is true, then there should be good, some, some good performing policies. And yes, smooth, low regret yes. means that you're performing as well also. You see what I mean? As, so if the truth is random, then you won't perform well and neither will anyone Oh, else. I see, and then we don't, then it doesn't. So it's kind of follows. I see, so it's related to yeah. So you definitely need some, you need to know something about the policy space, and, and you'll see the kind of assumption that, that we're making. It's of a different form. It's not explicitly about smoothness, although you certainly could take that route, absolutely. Um, but um, you'll, you'll see it's something different. Okay. All right. So this might seem like a hopeless problem, or I'm trying to make it sound hopeless anyway. But in fact, there was already an algorithm that solves this. There's an older algorithm uh, called X4, which solves this problem. It's kind of embarrassing that I was one of the authors on this paper, and I still don't know how to pronounce it, whether it should be XP4 or EXP4, or I, I don't even know. So anyway, it's this algorithm called X4, uh, which solves this problem. And it does it by maintaining a weight, weights over all the policies. So it maintains one weight for each one of the policies in the entire space. And it updates them in some particular way. And the regret of this algorithm is essentially optimal. The regret is proportional to the square root of k, the number of arms, times log of the number of policies in the space, divided by t. So it's going to zero at the rate 1 over square root of the number 
of rounds, which is the optimal rate. And a nice thing about this algorithm, it, if it, it works even if the data is not high ID. It works even for adversarially chosen data, which is a nice property that we're not even aiming for in this work. So that's the good stuff. Yeah? Is there something on how large the payoffs can be? In the uh, we're assuming that the rewards are always between zero and one. Okay, okay they're bounded, re the rewards. Okay. Sorry, I should have made that clear. Yeah, so that's the good stuff about this algorithm. The problem is, like I said, we're maintaining one weight for every policy. So the time and space requirements are going to be linear in the size of the policy space, which will be much too slow in our case because we're thinking of this space as being so gigantic. Okay, so as we already discussed, it seems rather hopeless to do better in fully general policy spaces. So but nevertheless, when the space is, has a nice structure of a kind that I'll describe, we're looking for algorithms whose time and space requirements will only be polylogarithmic in the size of the policy space. Okay, so that's what we're aiming for. Uh, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to, what kind of structure are we talking about? So to explain that, let me take a step back and consider the full information setting which is the exact same problem except where we get to see the rewards of all of the actions. All of the actions. Okay, so the setting is like this. Again, a context arrives. Nature chooses some rewards. The learner chooses an action. But now what's different is that the learner also gets to see the rewards for the actions that were not taken. Okay, the outcome if a different treatment had been prescribed to the patient. Okay, and this process continues, and again, the learner is accumulating some total reward. Now, what's nice about this setting, what makes it a whole lot easier, is that if you pick any policy pi, we can compute the rewards that would have been received by that policy. Okay, so we can just go back and say, well, this policy would have chosen this action on the first round and this one on the second round and so on. We can compute that. And then we can figure out what the total reward would have been for that policy. Okay? And that's, and the average of those is going to be a good estimate of the policy's expected reward, because the data is IID. Um, and then what we can do is a very simple algorithm. We can just choose the policy in our space, which is empirically best, which is best on the data we've collected so far. And that very simple algorithm will give you regret, which is like square root of log number of policies over t, which is basically optimal. But this algorithm can be computationally efficient? Sorry? But this algorithm is also not computationally efficient. Yeah, right. So, so the point is, how do you do this? How do you do this step of choosing an empirically best policy in the space? Well, to do that, you need something. OK, so what we're imagining is that's the assumption that we're making. We're assuming that you have a way of selecting the best policy based on observed rewards. And we're calling that an argmax oracle. By an oracle, I just mean an algorithm or a subroutine that we already have for doing that. And the input to this oracle, this subroutine, is uh, basically what I had on this slide, basically this table of contexts and rewards. That's what all this notation means, contexts and rewards. And the output is the policy in the space that would have given highest reward. All right, and we call it an argmax oracle because of this argmax. It's also called an ERM oracle and a classification oracle. And this might seem like a strange thing, until you notice that what we're really solving here is just an ordinary classification problem, okay? Classification learning. So contexts are playing the same role as examples in ordinary classification learning for people who have seen it in machine learning. Actions are playing the same role as labels and classes. The policies are playing the same role as classifiers. And the rewards, the rewards are kind of like a gain or a cost or a weight that you put on the examples. So classification learning is a problem 
that we already have lots of algorithms for their decision tree algorithms and SVMs and boosting and, oh, I can't forget to say neural networks and um, regression. Regression? Well, it's not a regression problem, but you could use logistic regression, I guess. So, so the point is that if we have a good classification algorithm for this policy space around, then we can use it, at least in this full information setting, to find a good policy. Yeah? Can we assume that the <clears throat> Oracle makes some approximation error, or should it really be a precise argmax? Okay, we are assuming that it's actually finding the optimal, okay? And we're hoping that it's going to be okay if it's an approximation, but that's something that has to be either tested or more theorems have to be proved. But we're assuming it can solve it perfectly. Okay, so coming back to the bandit setting, of course, we only see rewards for the actions that are taken. Okay, so again, here's where you get to see all the rewards, and in the bandit setting, we only see the rewards for the actions that were actually taken. So we can still, of course, compute the learner's total reward, but if you pick another policy, we can only observe the rewards for that policy on the rounds where that policy happened to have chosen the same action as the learner. Okay, so like on round two, it happened that they chose the same action, so we get to find out the reward for that policy. But say on round one and round three, the policy and the learner chose different actions, so we have no idea what the policy's reward would have been on those rounds. Okay, so we might like to use this oracle but the problem is, like I said, we only get to see some of the rewards, and the rewards we do see will be very highly skewed, highly biased, okay, which is going to be a big problem, because we're not choosing things just at random, we're actually trying to perform, behave well. Still, this oracle we would claim as a natural primitive, as I said, we have these algorithms sitting around for solving it. So the key question we're really asking here is, can we solve this problem if we're given access to such an oracle? So in other words, is it possible to use this oracle on banded data by somehow filling in the missing data in this table and somehow overcoming these bias issues? That's what we need to do. And as I said, we want optimal regret and time time space that's only logarithmic in the policy space size. So I guess we already talked about this, but we're thinking of this oracle as, as a theoretical idealization. Um, and it's hopefully capturing structure in the policy space. And in practice, we're hoping that we can just use off-the-shelf algorithms. Okay, so that's the problem. And in fact, there are already algorithms that do this to some degree. Uh, so there's an algorithm called Epsilon Greedy or Epoch Greedy. And what this algorithm does is on every round, we choose an action where most of the time we're choosing the best policy so far. So say 99% of the time we choose the empirically best policy. And 1% of the time we just choose an action uniformly at random. And this first part of choosing a best policy can be done using the oracle. So this is a nice simple algorithm uh, that just calls the oracle once per round. Um, and its regret bound is similar to what we had before, but rather than having a square root here, we're taking a third root, okay? So we're raising to the one-third power rather than the one-half power. So it's not optimal in terms of regret. Action, we don't, we, we're still, we are in the missing information setting, right? Correct. So the best with respect to what you see? So it's that kind of the skewed? Oh, the best is, no, the best is in terms of the actual rewards. So we're still comparing to the best rewards, even though the learner cannot observe them. Okay, so we're comparing to the reward oh, that. The rewards exist. The learner doesn't see them, but they exist somewhere. Right. Does the algorithm do it? Runs the, the algorithm runs. Yeah. What is the algorithm? Exactly. The algorithm, the algorithm doesn't know that. So what is the algorithm? Oh, I see. For the best part. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, 
there are different versions, but let, let's say the version where you choose the best policy based on, um, based on the rounds where you choose things uniformly at random, okay? Where you, and you only... See, uh, it's an unskewed partial information, but you use that. So you assume yeah. zero for everyone who... Yeah, you can assume zero, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I'm being, I, I admit I'm being vague yeah. here. But, yeah. It's sort of like the most intuitive possible thing that companies are probably doing anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so, so this algorithm, fast and simple, but the regret is not optimal. And, I, you know, I, it's arguable that there's a big difference between one-third and one-half. That, you know, it's the difference between an n cubed algorithm and an n squared algorithm. It can make a big difference. In fact, there is an, algor there is an algorithm that uh, solves this problem and gets optimal or nearly optimal regret. So this is an algorithm due to Dudek et al. Uh, so their algorithm is officially called randomized UCB, but pretty much universally, even the authors call this the monster algorithm. Uh, they call it the monster algorithm actually because it, it is a very complicated algorithm. Uh, it solves uh, multiple optimization problems on every round using the ellipsoid algorithm. Um, so very time intensive uh, would be, I, I think it would, it's fair to say that it would be challenging to implement it. Um, but it does get optimal regret. So it does get optimal regret. But because it's so complicated, it's also a very slow algorithm. So the number of calls to the oracle uh, is about t to the fourth times on every round. So t is the total number of time steps. And we want to think of t as being pretty large in the millions, maybe even in the billions. And so t to the fourth time on every round is going to be really, really slow but it does get optimal regret. Okay, so finally I can state the main result of this talk. So the main result is a new algorithm and a simple algorithm for this problem, contextual bandits with Oracle access. And the regret is nearly optimal, so we get that square root rather than the one-third power. There's some log terms in there, that's what the soft O is for. And the algorithm is much faster than the previous algorithm. Okay, so whereas the monster algorithm calls the oracle about t to the fourth times on every round. Our algorithm actually calls the oracle less than once per round, less than once per round. Yeah. Um, we actually don't. So I'm describing it as if we do, but in the in the paper we don't. And like the previous one that you mentioned, the monster, I assume you need to know t because there's. Or is it, is there's, it there's a kind of trick thing? that people always use to get rid of knowing t, where oh, you kind of every time the time is a power of two, you get yeah, amnesia yeah, yeah. and reinitialize yourself and assume the time horizon. Yeah, is yeah. You might you might be able to change this from big t to little t, but it's not going to make any difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Is the log pi supposed to be in the denominator of that? Yeah. Time? Oh shit! I was hoping nobody would ask about that. <laughs> Um, yes, this is correct. Um, and we've talked a lot about how to explain that intuitively and have not really come up with a good answer for it. Let me I make mean, a narrower question. Okay. It looks like I can achieve fewer AMO calls with the same regret bound. Oh, no, no, the regret oh. bound's going to get worse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The regret bound will get worse. I'm making up a bunch of dummy policies that are completely useless and recommend the same arm every time and are just used to inflate the denominator. Okay. Yeah. The regret gets worse. Yeah. yeah. So it comes from there are various things being traded off, and when you optimize them, yeah. Yeah. somehow this is what you end up with. Okay? Yeah. Yes? It sort of makes sense because if the policy space is incredibly complicated, running AMO is probably a complicated thing to do. And so you don't want to do it that frequently. That's probably not taken into account in the reason why it calls it that option, but it's a nice feature of the algorithm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So right, so so on average, the algorithm is calling this oracle about square root of divided by t log number of policies per round. So about one over 
uh, square root of t times per round, or said differently, about once every square root of t rounds. Okay, so much faster than the previous algorithm, and well, just very fast. So um, what I want to do for the rest of the talk is try to sketch the main ideas of this algorithm. All right. Um, okay, so as I said before, selection bias is a major problem for us. Um, so um, so you, you have this basic problem that you choose an action, you see the reward for that action. What about the other actions? You know, what can you, is there any way of estimating the rewards for the other actions in an unbiased way? So in fact, there's a very simple and old trick called inverse propensity weighting. Uh, uh, so let me just very quickly explain how this works. So suppose you want to estimate the expected value of some random variable, like you want to know uh, the probability that some unfair coin will come up heads. Uh, and to make the problem harder, uh, we'll say, first of all, that with probability p, you get to observe x, but only once, so you only get to see this coin flipped once. And with probability 1 minus p, you don't even get to observe it at all, which is kind of like the setting we're in, because most of the actions, you don't get to see their rewards at all. So the trick is simply to define this other random variable, x hat, where we take, if x was observed, we take its outcome and divide by p, just divide by the probability of seeing it, and otherwise use 0. And <clears throat> if you think about it, you can see that the expected rent value of this new random variable, which you always, is always defined, even if you don't observe x, is equal to the correct expected value. In other words, by this simple trick, you're getting an unbiased estimate. Okay, so, and then, so we can use that idea here to get unbiased estimates for all of the actions, not just the ones that were observed. I'm going through this part kind of quickly because this was old stuff prior to our work. Um, so, but hopefully you can get a feeling for the main ideas if you haven't seen it before. Um, so basically we can use this trick to get these unbiased estimates for all of the actions, and then we can use those to estimate the expected reward and the regret of any policy. As long as P is not zero. As long as P is not zero, right. So, okay, so it seems like, wow, this just solves everything, right? I mean, what's the point of all this? Because you've got these estimates now that are unbiased that have the right uh, expected value. So are we done? Well, absolutely not, because the variance of these estimates might be extremely large. An extreme case, like Glenn said, is where P is zero, but even if P is just tiny, the variance is going to be huge. You know, and intuitively it has to be. You shouldn't be able to get some you shouldn't be able to estimate the bias of a coin by not even seeing it flipped even once. And okay, so the point is that to get these good estimators, we have to control variance. Okay, that's the point. Okay, so that's the first observation. So we're going to need some way of choosing actions randomly or semi-randomly. And here's kind of a template for the approach that we're taking. So on each round, we're going to compute a distribution that I'll call Q over the policy space. So we'll compute a distribution over all of the policies. And then we'll randomly pick one policy according to that distribution over this space. And then when a new context comes along, we'll just choose the same action as the one selected by this policy pi. Okay, so this is not an algorithm. It's like a template for an algorithm. And to turn it into an algorithm, we have to say how to choose this distribution Q. Um, now, already this seems like a bad idea uh, because it seems like the time and space, even just to store this distribution Q, let alone to compute it, is going to be at least linear in the number of policies. So already this seems bad. I'm going to try to make things sound bad and then worse and then worse and worse and then we're going to dig out of the hole, okay? Okay, so main problem is how do we 
choose this distribution Q? Well, on every round, we want to pick a Q with certain properties. So I'm going to describe those properties that we want Q to have. So on the one hand, we want actions, we, when we choose actions according to a randomly selected policy from Q, we want to get low regret. So the first requirement is we want our regret, or we only have estimates, so our estimated regret to be small. Makes sense. We want to choose actions with high reward. So like I said, we can estimate the regret of any policy. So let me call that regret hat. And then this is the expected regret if we choose the policy according to Q. And we want it to be small. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is we have to control variance. Like I said, we need low variance for our estimates to be decent. We want to ensure that the estimates we compute in the future will be accurate. So to do that, we have to control the variance. So you can write down an expression for an estimate of the variance. I'm not going to write it down because it's a little messy. For any particular policy pi. And we want that variance to be small. And importantly, we want it to be small for every policy in the entire space. Okay, because we want to get a good estimate of the expected reward of every policy in the space. So we need the variance to be controlled for all of them. So these are the two properties we need for Q. And by the way, they correspond to exploitation, because here we're trying to get high reward, and exploration, because here we're trying to ensure that our estimates in the future are good. Okay, so it's exploitation and exploration made explicit. All right, so all we have to do, all we have to do is find a distribution Q with these, that satisfy these constraints. And in addition, we want it to be a distribution, and I'll just make that constraint explicit. And we can give names to these, the regret constraint, variance constraint, and distribute, it should be a distribution. And it turns out you can make the problem a tiny bit simpler, easier by allowing the sum of the weights on the policies to be at most one because it turns out if it's less than one, you can convert it to a distribution. It's a little trick for doing that. So we call this our optimization problem OP. And this is the idea of the algorithm to try to, on every round, to solve this optimization problem and choose policies according to them. And this is similar to the technique used in the monster paper. But it seems awful. Like I said, I'm trying to dig us into a hole. And, you know, let me just try and convince you of what an awful idea this is. Okay? So it's an awful idea because in terms of optimization, the variables are these Q of pi's, and you have one variable for every policy. So you have an exponential number of variables if we're thinking of this policy space as exponentially large. And you have one constraint for every policy. Again, it's exponentially large. Um, also, these constraints are not linear. They involve this variance term. I didn't write it out, but it's actually a little bit unpleasant. And we don't even know if this thing is feasible. Okay? So now that you've pranked and made your interesting learning the same amounts about every possible policy. Sorry? Some of the constraints is a uniform constraint over all policies. It's actually, yeah, the way I wrote it, it looks uniform. It's actually, if you fill this in, it's not quite uh, uniform. You actually can soften up the constraint for the worse policies. You don't need as strong a constraint for the policies that are performing. Yeah, yeah. But I'm hiding that. Okay. Okay, so it looks awful, but it turns out if we can solve it, then we can prove that the regret is essentially optimal. Um, and uh, you know, the proof is basically that the regret constraints ensure that we get low regret, provided that our estimates are decent. And the variance constraints ensure that those estimates in the future actually will be good enough. OK, so that's in two lines the main idea of our proof, which actually goes on for a few pages. But that's the basic idea. Yeah. 
this regret bound comes from somewhere else, and then the things that you fill in for small and small come from the, what you need to get this theorem. Oh, um, yeah, 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 right, right. Obviously, with the con constants built in, right. Okay, but how are we going to solve it? Well, the basic idea is to find a constraint which is violated and fix it, or attempt to fix it and repeat. Simple enough. Here it is in a little bit more detail. So we can start with Q being the all zero vector. We can do that because it only has to be at most one, doesn't have to be equal to one. So we can set all of the weights to be zero. And then repeatedly, well, first of all, if you look at the regret constraint or the subdistributional constraint, if those are violated, we can just multiply Q by a constant smaller than one. We can just rescale them and force them to be satisfied. Okay, we can fix them just by rescaling. Otherwise, we can find a policy in the space for which the corresponding variance constraint is violated. Okay, so we find a policy pi for which this constraint is violated. Turns out, and if none of them exist, then all of the constraints must be satisfied and we're done. Otherwise, all we do is add some number alpha to the corresponding weight for the policy whose constraint was violated. Okay, so I know there was a lot of complicated machinery to get to this point, but when I say the algorithm is simple, this is what I'm referring to. This is the algorithm. Start with the all zero vector, do these very simple tests and very simple fixes until you're done. That yeah, so it turns out, it turns out that to solve this, to find a policy where this constraint is violated, I don't have time to go through the details, but you can do it using the oracle. Okay, so the oracle gets called once per round. Okay, so I'll come back to that. Right. Sorry, sorry, once per round of this algorithm, okay? So this is happening on a single round. So, okay. So, but once per iteration of this, of this in, kind of inner loop. Okay. So if it halts, then it has to be a solution because everything is satisfied. But how long does it take? Well, to analyze it, we use a potential function. So what we do is we write down this function. And don't worry about the math. The math is just to make the point that you can write it down, okay? That's the, otherwise, I don't want you to look at it. The point is that's this function, and it takes as input non-negative negative vectors, Q, over the policy space, okay? So not only does Q not need to be a distribution or even a sub-distribution, it just has to be a non-negative vector. It's defined for all of them. And you can write down this real valued function. And it turns out that this function has some great properties. It's always non-negative. It's convex. And what's really nice is that if you have a vector q that minimizes this function, then that vector has to be a solution to the optimization problem. So at the minimum of this crazy function, we get a solution to this func optimization problem. And the key step is to look at the partial derivatives of this function, which turn out to be proportional to the variance constraint for that policy. So it's kind of like all those constraints get encoded in this one function. And I described the earlier algorithm in terms of finding constraints and, violate, and fixing them, but it turns out that another way of thinking about that algorithm is as a coordinate descent algorithm. A different way of thinking about it is that we're doing coordinate descent on the same function phi. So in other words, on every round, we're just adjusting one of the coordinates, uh, uh, which can be written as Q of pi. Okay, and so to analyze the algorithm, we can prove that on every iteration, this potential drops a lot. We can do that just but with the Taylor expansion. 
And since this function is non-negative, that immediately gives us a bound on the total number of iterations. Because on every iteration, it drops a lot. We know what it starts out at. We know it never goes below zero. Immediately get a bound on the total number of iterations. Okay, so in particular, we can prove that on each round, little t, the algorithm halts after about square root of t iterations of this algorithm. And as a corollary, so we were worried before that the solution of Q might itself be gigantic, proportional to the number of policies. But in fact, Q starts out as zero, and on every iteration, you just adjust one of those weights. So it's going to be a sparse solution. It's going to be zero in all but this many coordinates. So, uh, so, um, okay, so in fact, we can do things a little bit better. And I realize I'm almost out of time, but I'm also almost done. So, so far, we assume that we solve this problem from scratch on every round. So that'll give about t to the 3 halves calls to this oracle and in, in t rounds. In fact, we can do a lot better. So first of all, since the data is IID, we can actually use the same solution for many rounds. We don't have to do anything for most of the rounds because the data is IID for these long epochs. And secondly, we don't have to reinitialize the algorithm at zero every time. We can instead initialize the algorithm based on the previous solution that we had computed before, rather than starting fresh each time. Excuse me. So we can use warm start. And if we do that, uh, so if we only update this distribution, let's say, on rounds, which are perfect squares on rounds 1, 4, 9, and so on, then we'll get near optimal regret. But we only need about square root of capital T calls to the oracle across the entire sequence of T rounds. Okay, so we get a bound on the total number of, uh, of calls to the oracle, which is smaller than the number of rounds. Yeah, Bobby. So the information for the warm start is really helps because it gives you a lower initial potential when you resolve okay. Yeah, so what happens is you're getting new data across this epoch since the last time you computed the solution. And that does or can cause the potential to go up. But when you analyze it, it turns out it can't go up too much. And so you can, you can prove the whole thing based on that one potential function. Yeah. You, have to, <coughs> you don't change Q, but you have to change your policy of resampling your policy. Is that right? You're resampling your policy. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Yeah. Uh, well, why is it easy to sample Q? Oh, well, Q is not big. So Q is, uh, Q is actually going to be non-zero only in this many uh, places. So you can just store the whole thing. Zero. Yeah. And actually, it's true also, it's true also across the entire sequence, even if you're using this warm start. The sparsity is never going to be bigger than the number of calls to the oracle. Okay, so that's really it. So we presented this new algorithm for contextual bandits. Gives nearly optimal regret, simple and fast, and the number of calls is uh, much less than once per round. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, a lot of open problems, future directions, some of them came up in the talk. Uh, first of all, we need to try it experimentally. Uh, another question is whether we can get an online version of this. So we kind of have a mismatch that we're getting data online, but we're using this batch data. It would be more natural to have an online oracle of some kind. Um, you know, prove lower bounds. And then a last open problem is to handle adversarial data rather than IID data. So let me stop there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, to handle adversarial data, is there any lower bound? Is the, is the hope to get the best kind of uh, statistical uh, bound with adversarial data? 
Uh, yeah, that would be that would be nice. Uh, yeah. So so X four X four like I said handles adversarial data gets optimal regret. So. Yeah. So in principle, it seems like it could be possible. I don't know. Yeah, Bobby. The question turns out to be a continuation of yet else. So a, a natural approach that you must have tried was take X4 and try to implement its sampling procedure by calling an AMO. Yeah. Do you know for sure that that's computationally possible? <laughs> or is it possible that might yet work out? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't know if it's hard. I just know that, yes, we have thought about that and couldn't solve it. But yeah, maybe things along the lines of um, follow the leader or something, follow the peer leader, or I don't know. It would be great. Don't know how to do it. Okay, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>